Okay, we're back for another Media Law Chat. I'm here with Kathy Olson. Kathy, why don't you introduce us, introduce yourself to us, and tell us where you're from and what case you want to talk about today. Okay, well, uh, I'm Kathy Olson. I was a lawyer and a journalist, and now I'm a professor at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Excuse me. And today, uh, we're going to talk about Zucchini versus Scripps Howard. Okay, a fun, what, like, I just love a chat about a human cannonball. That's, exactly. <laughs> that's a, that's a, it's a great case to cover. So tell us why you, uh, why you chose this case. What's interesting about it? Well, it's, it, I mean, it's got a human cannonball, right? I mean, it, it's, it's one of the more interesting fact patterns of uh, media law cases, certainly at the Supreme Court, I think. Um, and, and it interests me because I'm writing a book on the right of publicity and how it conflicts with First Amendment um, values. And so this was the first Supreme Court case, well, the only Supreme Court case so far that uh, dealt with right of publicity. And um, it really was about, <clears throat> excuse me, the balance uh, that needs to be done between the First Amendment and the right of publicity. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not really a, a landmark case in the sense that it gave us a brand new test, uh, you know, like New York Times versus Sullivan. But I think it's an important case because it is the, the only time the Supreme Court has addressed this issue. Um, and it's, in some ways, it's important for what it, the Supreme Court didn't do, which is, as in New York Times versus Sullivan, um, give us sort of a tool through, you know, actual malice to um, figure out how the best balance is between First Amendment and these, um, you know, uh, tort rights of, of uh, private parties. Mm -hmm. So explain the right of publicity briefly, because I think it's something that a lot of people misunderstand. It's something that they get wrong about this case. Oh, sure. So yeah, it, 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 in general, the, the right of publicity is the right of uh, any person to control the use of their name and their image, any other identifying characteristics um, for commercial purposes, which is generally uh, for endorsements and advertisements or in merchandise, like putting your face on a mug or a t-shirt or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so what's, what's interesting about Zucchini, of course, is that this wasn't either of those. It, it was really the, the heart of it was um, that the uh, local TV station broadcast his entire human cannonball act. Um, and so, you know, it, it wasn't based on that they showed his, his image or they used his name. Of course, that would be okay uh, for news purposes. Um, but what mattered was it was the entire, you know, 15 second um, human cannonball act. And so um, that's really what the, what the Supreme Court majority uh, focused on. Uh, you know, the dissent calls it an incantation. They kept saying the entire act, the entire performance. Um, but that really was key because otherwise it would just be an easy uh, news use of, you know, you're allowed to show people on the news. Yeah, how long? It wasn't that long a performance. No, 15 yeah. seconds. F right? Yeah, 15, yeah. 15, 15 seconds. seconds. So right. when a normal, you know, news producer would say, oh, that's, that's not a problem at all. When you say... Um, it's it, it's not uh, congruent with First Amendment values. What do you what do you mean by that? Talk, say a little bit more about those values. Well, the idea that um, you you know in, in right of publicity cases, especially the right to be able to talk about real people, to be able to write a biography of somebody, to be able to um, do a news story about somebody and use their name and use their image. Um, you know, one of the more recent cases was about a docudrama, the uh, mm -hmm. feud miniseries, where Olivia de Havilland uh, sued because she was portrayed in this um, docudrama about Hollywood, pretty small part, um, but she, she wanted money for it, uh, even though it's, it's history. You know, you, we, we can't have uh, people locking up their life stories in a way that uh, keeps people from being able to write histories and biographies and, and even fictionalized um, biographies. And how did that case play out? Well, it was a scary case at first because the trial court uh, did, did not dismiss the case um, on First Amendment grounds. Everybody expected it would go nowhere. Um, and the, the trial judge said, no, you know, this is something to go to trial with. Uh, the uh, FX, I think, is the network. Um, appealed that and the 
uh, California appellate court did dismiss it on First Amendment grounds. Um, and I think last year the U.S. Supreme Court uh, refused to hear it. So it's, it's over, but it was a little scary for people who make their living uh, writing about other people, whether again for, for biography or, or for fictionalized accounts. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it was the shock waves. <laughs> you know, people, yeah. the, the trial court decision, people went, uh, it, it would have affected so much content uh, that we all encounter from magazine articles to books to, you know, a, a Netflix series. Um, it, it, it could have had really wide reaching ramifications, which when Zucchini was decided, that, that was the fear, right? That, you know, a lot of people reacted to it saying, well, this is just going to change the nature of news coverage. But have we really seen that? You know, did, did it have those implications that people feared? You know, I, I don't. I don't think it did in the sense that um, you know the newsworthiness defense, uh, you know, is so strong and it still is. Um, but but I think what it did was, um, and and it's such a unique case in that how often do you have a live performance that's going to be put on the evening news in its entirety, right? Mm -hmm. And again, you know, the majority was just all about this entire performance and that that's how he makes his money. You know, it, it, in some ways it reminds me of INS versus AP, the hot news, because, you know, in both cases, there was an underlying thing that's not copyrightable. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, it was facts. And in this case, it was a live performance. Um, if it were, if he had recited a poem or sang a song, that the underlying song and poem would be copyrighted. And so you could talk about fair use and how much did they take and that sort of thing. But in this case, it, it's not because it was live, it wasn't fixed. And so, um, you know, I really think the, the majority was worried about the, the equities, the unfairness of it in a way that, you know, um, sort of made them want to, you know, give him the, the right to exploit his, his performance and, um, but doesn't have a whole lot of precedential value because it's not going to happen that way very often. And it, but it is our, our only Supreme Court precedent when it comes to right of publicity, right? We've never had any, anything else. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and so it does have a legacy of, of some kind, you know, they, they first of all recognize that right of publicity claims were valid, that, you know, the, the state has, a, has a, uh, an interest in allowing people to bring those claims. Um, and when they did the balance between First Amendment values and uh, right of publicity, uh, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't really give us much to go on. They, they didn't give us a, a good way to safeguard the First Amendment in a way that some of the past cases have. Um, and, and they found against a news organization. And so certainly it's used by, uh, you know, those who are trying to sue news organizations as, as a strong precedent. And, uh, but I, I think it's, it's not a great one because it's just almost a, uh, the, the uniqueness of the, the fact situation makes it hard to really extrapolate from it. Yeah, and it's one that, I mean, I, I'd have to go back and, and think, I'm, I'm speaking on the fly, which is never, which is never a good idea. Um, but it's, it's rare to have, something that is the, the, the one of the well, one of a kind so the only thing we have on right of publicity but also such a narrow holding right so we have we have plenty of narrow holdings in first amendment cases but they're not the only one right you know there, there are tons of things that deal with privacy but this particular case we're going to hold that that there may be a case in which um, the right to privacy trumps First Amendment. So we consider this, this holding narrow. But in this case, it's a narrow holding and one of a kind. It's just, it's just an odd duck. It really is. It's, it's you know, when, when I talk about it in class, I'm always, you're almost hesitant, hesitant to talk about it as a, any kind of precedent because it's so one-off. And, you know, they, they, haven't, they haven't heard a case again on the right of publicity. And of course, since then, the right of publicity has just, you know, grown so huge that, you know, the Supreme Court really should probably take another look at it and, and that the need for that balance and, and give some guidance. Because when you look, you know, the news is one area where I, I think at least courts have been very um, solicitous of, of protecting news uses. Um, yeah, but in, in general, first, the First Amendment tests that are used, you know, different states and different circuit courts have different ways of weighing things in, in art cases and those things of transformativeness and predominant use. You know, there's not even one test that you can point to 
for this, you know, super important balancing that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I also, I, I present it in a fairly minor way in class just because it, it does seem so limited, but I always make sure to include it because, you know, you, you got to show a human cannonball. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just one of the funnier, it's one of the funnier, uh, funnier set of facts that we encounter, much, much yeah. more levity than some of the other awful things that we have to present. Exactly. Well, and it's funny, too, because um, I did some research at, at the um, Library of Congress for this book on, um, and I looked at the uh, Supreme Court file on this case, and um, Justice Powell, um, his law clerk, wrote him a note about, you know, should we take this case or not, and he said, this looks like it could be fun. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in some ways, they decided to take it because it was looked like a fun case, you know. Um, I'm not sure how that worked out because Powell was on the dissent. He wrote the dissenting opinion. So, it, 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 you know, maybe he shouldn't have taken it just because it was fun. And the dissenters really did focus on the fact that this was a news story, that they did not, see, they were, you know, trying to differentiate this from, from what they would consider a true commercial use. Yeah, the, the, the majority really looked at what was taken, the entire thing, and the dissent really looked at why was it taken, and the idea that, you know, news needs to be protected. Um, they said, basically, you know, you, you can take an entire thing for the news, you know, if it's, if it's in a news purpose. Um, they also sort of argued about, well, what do you mean by an entire act? Uh, you know, that was such an important part for the, the majority. And they made the point that, well, you know, it wasn't just the 15 seconds where the cannon goes off and he goes into the net 200 feet away. It was the build up, and it was, you know, and so, you know, I, I'm not sure how important that is other than that they're sort of pointing out that the majority um, relying on this whole, you know, entire performance thing, that's not even a very good standard to give to lower courts because that's a difficult thing to, to measure. Yeah, and Zucchini never had to show any actual economic harm, right? He never had to show that this damaged him. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, I, I think he wanted um, the, this was in his family forever. They'd done the, this act. And so, you know, they, he was concerned about it happening again, I'm sure, um, because, you know, it, it's, it, it's an interesting uh, question of, of whether that is something that is going to keep people from going to see the act live. Um, some might say that people might be more interested in going to see it live. Um, but that, you know, that's, that's not really um, what it depends on, because if you've taken the whole thing, you know, when thinking sort of a fair use, you know, that it, it doesn't really matter because it's yours to control. Right, and it's, it's also interesting because it's a case of another time. You know, this was, a, this was you know, TV news, and you think about, well, what actually would happen to Zucchini if, um, if that TV news station took it and, and they put it on Facebook Live, or they posted it to YouTube, and you can see that there could be much more damage, that I can, I can watch it here rather than, uh, rather than go out um, and, and go to the county fair to actually encounter it live. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and even the differentiation between in a newscast where it's clearly for news purposes, but what if it wasn't? And then it makes it harder to say, is this a news purpose or are they really exploiting it uh, you know, for, for commercial purposes? Yeah, it's a great case. I'm really glad, I'm really glad that you uh, joined us to talk about it. It's just, a, I, I, I agree with Powell's clerk. It's fun. It is fun. <laughs> yeah. On the wrong side of the decision, but it, but yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. That's my pleasure. Thanks for, for having me. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate you being here. Have a great day, Kathy. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye.